I want to begin uh, with uh, acknowledging uh, the territory. We acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Sankeys, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And I want to encourage us to go beyond just thinking about acknowledging the territory and our, relation, our place here and to actually uh, to borrow a, a phrase from Don Raid's lyrics, uh, to think about active solidarity, about ways in which we can turn thought and, and, uh, and uh, consideration into actionable things, things that we can actually do to start making uh, these wrongs right. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, which is you, <laughs> um, I'm uh, a professor here at UVic. My name is Shama Boyarin. Uh, and uh, one of the areas that I've been working on for the past few years is metal studies, and one particular, in, in particularly in uh, the very recent years, uh, one of the reasons I've become interested in metal and metal studies is the potential that metal and metal studies have to disrupt uh, the status quo, to uh, serve as a means for uh, fighting uh, against uh, ingrained power and, and to kind of uh, work towards uh, uh, issues of social justice and, and towards uh, equality. And I say potential because both metal and academia can also serve, sadly, as tools to uh, entrench power and, and to not uh, disrupt and to uh, work uh, in favor of traditional uh, patriarchal uh, ideals. So we have to actually think about how it is that metal can be used this way and how metal studies and academia can, uh, can serve a justice. Uh, we, this is uh, one of the reasons that I'm really, really excited about today's talk because um, uh, Um, Don Raid as a band and as an entity really, I think, are one of the strongest voices that we currently have to, uh, that have really been able to articulate a way in which heavy metal, black metal can, uh, can be a, 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 a voice, a, a sounding board for the need to fight, for the need to organize, and to uh, work towards uh, uh, issues of uh, uh, refugee st uh, status, uh, the environment, uh, workers' rights, all these things that are intertwined, that are uh, really uh, linked uh, in the current uh, situation worldwide in oppression. Uh, they describe uh, their music as angry songs for chaotic times, and in their uh, uh, lyrics, they talk about the need uh, for new tales of resistance, and that's precisely what I see them uh, achieving in, in, their, in their music. Uh, further, music critic Kim Kelly has described their latest album, Behold Sedition, Plain Song, as melodic, aggressive, and heavy in all the right places. Further, she says, Behold Sedition, Plain Song is a brilliant piece of mili militant propaganda designed to delight and flame in equal measures. Uh, and I'll just quote one of the verses uh, from uh, their uh, recent album from A Time for Courage at the Borderlines, which is a song about the refugee crisis. And it asks us as the listeners, what if what was needed was another pair of hands, active solidarity, the skills that you have? What if all it took to help get people through was someone else who could resist? What if that was you? And I find that a really powerful message among all the uh, powerful messages in their album. So with that, please join me in welcoming Fabian to talk to us. And a bit about the format, although we can be a little bit loose with it given the small. Uh, I asked Fabian to talk for a little bit, and then we'll have some time for uh, Q&A. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, for anybody who doesn't know me. Fabian uh, Dazzle, I play guitar in the Anarchist Black Metal Band, Dawn Raid. We're currently on a West Coast tour of North America um, and with Ragnar. And it's been great to be here. And thank you very much for asking us to come and talk. We'll always talk about extreme metal and anarchist politics that we chance that we're given. So 
let's go through it in a formal setting. Um, the perspective that I'm going to talk from is the perspective I know, which is my own, which is as somebody living in Liverpool in the UK um, and living within that context as an anarchist. Um, and any of the terms I use at any point or any of the bands I mention or anything that I say isn't clear, feel free to interrupt me and ask for clarification. Um, sometimes I may use abbreviations or shorthand for certain things. I'm absolutely happy to be interrupted. Um, and yeah, I'm really keen to hear other people's thoughts on anything that comes up as well. Um, primarily I'm going to talk about the relationship between anti-fascism and extreme music. Um, I think that's something that comes up a lot with Don Reid. Um, people tend to latch on to the fact that it's an anti-fascist black metal band as a, the major part of it being an anarchist band. And that's slightly to do with black metal's history of having issues with the extreme right. Um, so to start off I'd like to tell a bit of a story about the anarcho-punk band Crass and an incident that happened at one of their gigs in 1979 that helps illustrate some of the some of the sort of conflicts that Don Raider dealing with at the moment. Um, so Crass were playing a benefit show in the East End of London in 1979 for an anarchist group called Persons Unknown. Uh, there was a try at Persons Unknown were an active anarchist group similar to the Angry Brigade and they were facing uh, huge charges. To raise money for their defence, Crass organised a gig. Unfortunately at the time, a group in the UK called the British Movement, a neo-Nazi skinhead group, had started to pay a lot of attention to anarchist music events and anarchist cultural and social events and it started to really violently disrupt them and to, and to interrupt them to try and stop them from happening. Um, there was a bit of a fight for cultural space in London at the time. Um, I got this account from an anti-fascist called Martin Lux in his book The Anti-Fascist. Um, in that book he, he describes his sort of day-to-day -day life as an anti-fascist at that time. Um, so Martin was asked by Crass and some of the other organisers of the gig to help with security. Unfortunately he was only given very short notice and he wasn't really aware that there was an explicit threat of violence at the show. When he turned up he found that there was already about, I think he said there was about 20 to 30 Poland heads he describes them as, so neo-Nazi skinheads who had come to the show with the sole intention of disrupting Crass playing. He just said that his, the advantage of that was that he had time through the other bands who were playing that night to try and organise something to stop this show from getting shut down. Martin Lux understood very clearly that if this show got shut down, it wasn't just going to be a, a defeat for that one night, it was going to embolden the far right in London at that time. And he, he reckoned that if that show got shut down, that the next crash show would get shut down, the next anarcho punk show would get shut down, then that cultural space would be lost. You'd have a recruiting ground for the far right. The far right would appear strong and victorious in London. And then they'd start shutting down left-wing and anarchist organising spaces. And undoubtedly that would grow and grow, as has been seen in history before. So Martin Lux was an anarchist. He was part of the, a group called the Direct Action Movement, um, an anarchist anti-fascist group. He practised different forms of anti-fascism, including moment anti-fascism, including physical opposition. He phoned around people who, who he knew who were in London at that time and there was a group of Manchester United football hooligans who had no real interest in crass or their music but who understood the importance of anti-fascism and they were happy to come and support Martin in his job of keeping this gig safe. When they turned up it was kind of too late, there was already a lot of members of the British movement who were in the hall waiting for crass to start. There had been small skirmishes within the venue. Martin, with the help of the Manchester United football hooligans who were there, and other members of what was the Socialist Workers Party at that time, who later went on to form a group called Red Action, got together and confronted the British movement neo-Nazis. That became a, an extremely violent encounter. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> from Martin's account of it, it was a real victory for anti-fascism. The anti-fascists managed to physically oppose the fascists. They managed to eject no anti-fascists were hurt. They prevented serious levels of violence from a neo-Nazi group in London towards people who were going to a gig. Um, and they put down a real marker that these anarchist cultural spaces were going to be protected and defended. It was seen as a huge defeat by the far right. Unfortunately, Following that, Martin, the Direct Action Movement, Red Action and the other left-wing groups involved in that were heavily criticised by elements of the left for the violence that happened that night. 
But as time went on, people began to look back on that as an extremely important day in anti-fascism in London. A gig that was going to be disrupted. It's worth noting that Crass didn't actually get to play because the whole thing exploded before they took to the stage. So they weren't able to play. But the important thing was that they were able to play after that in London again. And their gigs weren't opposed for a long time after that. And when was this? This was in 1979. Okay. So you had a gig that was effectively defended, even though it didn't get to happen the way people hoped, it was effectively defended. The British movement retreated from those cultural spaces, retreated from trying to shut down gigs. And that anarchist scene that like was a huge influence on the world <coughs> with bands like Crass and Rudimentary Peni, and even through to Deviated Instinct and, and the sort of anarcho crust and metal scene that came out of that, was able to flourish in the UK without that threat from the far right. If they had been defeated that night, I think it could have been a, a really different story. You would have had fascists emboldened and attack, able to attack cultural spaces and shut it down. Out of that as well, it's worth noting that you had collaboration between anarchists from the direct action movement and traditional socialists and communists, as well as sort of traditional working class football hooligans working together um, to defeat fascism and putting other political differences aside and other cultural interests aside, really, because from the account, most of the people there had no real interest in an orco punk. And um, they got together and done that. You seen then the people who were from the Socialist Workers' Party who went on to form Red Action and the anarchists who were part of the direct action movement in around 1985 or what became anti-fascist action. And I think the legacy of anti-fascist action that was formed in the 80s became a, a global phenomenon right up to today's modern Antifa. Sort of takes its it takes a lot of its influence from that group in the 80s. So you had something that was a, a cultural battleground that was effectively defended. At the time they faced criticism, but it left a legacy of modern anti-fascism <coughs> being an effective way to deal with the far right when they threaten our cultural spaces. Um, the term modern anti-fascism gets thrown around a lot, and I think it's worth clarifying what it means. As Don Reid, we've talked about the importance of anti-fascism and modern anti-fascism. All it means is that you consider a diversity of tactics, you consider that physical opposition could be an effective component of any anti-fascist strategy. Physical opposition should never be the only component of anti-fascism, it is going to be about hearts and minds as well. But at that point, when your gigs and your cultural spaces and your social spaces are under threat, um, it's important that we don't cede that territory, that we're able to actively defend ourselves, because it's not just about us on that night and stopping our gig, whether it's Crass in 1979 or Don Raid in 2020, or Moscow Death Brigade in 2016. <coughs> um, whatever it is, like these, each of these actions are going to have consequences beyond our single, our single night or our single gig. Thinking then about how modern anti-fascism relates to wider anti-fascism and anarchism, it leads us to thinking about cultural anti-fascism. I suppose that's where some of the decisions when we formed Dawn Raid came from. Um, we formed Dawn Raid as a black metal band because we wanted to play in a black metal band. It's the music that we listen to, it's the music that we enjoy. Um, but we were also coming out of other bands that had played in the European anarchist music scene for a long time, playing in squats and social centres, places that were explicitly anti-fascist, that maybe weren't that used to having black metal bands playing there because of black metal's history and problems with having elements of the far right involved in it. Um, we made the decision that we wanted to continue touring in that scene that we knew that was always supportive of us and that we were part of and supportive too and that to do that effectively we had to take a clear stand. So from day one we were open that Donald is an anarchist band and it's an anti-fascist band. That was, that was who we were, it wasn't a deliberate tactic. We didn't expect it to be as controversial as it became mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people were shocked that we were so open about our political beliefs but that was purely because we wanted to still be able to play in the squats that we were used to playing in and we wanted to be open and, and create a space that where people knew that fascist ideas weren't going to be tolerated. Um, this, this takes into the idea of cultural anti-fascism, that I think is important if we're going to stop things like what happened in 1979 from happening again. Ideally, what happened with Crass and the British movement shouldn't have happened. You don't want things getting to the point where you have violent confrontations at gigs. That's, like, that's a, a really horrendous outcome for anybody. Um, it did happen, and it was dealt with the way people felt at that time it should have been dealt with. <coughs> if we can use cultural anti-fascism and other tactics before then, I think that's a much better outcome for everybody.
which sort of leads on to the idea of no platforming um, in black metal. Um, I don't know how much people are familiar with the idea of no platforming, but it's a, an established practice in anti-fascism for a long time that we don't give these ideas room to breathe. We don't allow them to take up social and cultural space. Um, we don't allow them to go unchallenged. It becomes very difficult, and it's a very hot topic in black metal, about freedom of speech versus no platforming. Um, as Don Radar approaches that, it's, it's really simple. That if we can control the platforms that we give people, we shouldn't be allowing people the room or the space to promote ideas that are hurtful and hateful and threatening. Um, the free speech argument, like that's a whole other probably series of lectures rather than one small talk on. Um, but really, I don't think anybody should have to give their space to allow somebody to express hateful and, and hurtful ideas, especially if they're not the people who are going to be hurt by them. Um, and that's where no platforming come in, comes in. Uh, morally, we think it's the right thing to do. But also tactically, if we stop people being able to spread those ideas, you prevent people who may be vulnerable for whatever reason going down that path. You prevent them from, from playing out with those ideas. And you, get, you get the chance to present them with something more powerful and more positive instead. Uh, there was an incident in 2016 in Montreal um, that was really famous. Um, a festival called Mesa de Moore. Um, there was a band called Graveland who were booked to play, um, among lots of other bands, including bands who certainly aren't fascist or neo-Nazi or NSBM, which is National Socialist Black Metal. Um, Graveland, however, whether you can debate to what level they are, Graveland are widely accepted as being a fascist band or a band with neo-Nazi sympathies. Um, people living in Montreal decided that this wasn't acceptable, that this band were playing in their town. Um, and they took it upon themselves to organise around that. They raised awareness of it and they contacted both the promoters for the festival and the venue and said that they weren't happy to have a band promoting such hateful and hurtful ideologies that threaten all the different people who are in the metal in Montreal as well as the wider community. They weren't happy for them to perform there. Um, and they said that they weren't going to, they asked for, Grave, for, the, for the show to be cancelled or for Graveland to be pulled from the bill. The promoters decided to go ahead with the show and to have Graveland continue to play as billed. Um, the anti-fascist groups in Montreal were true to their word and stopped the show from happening. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen the videos from it or the news reports or photographs, but it was very effective well, in anti-fascism. They built barricades in the street to physically prevent people from going there. Um, they were prepared to stop that show from happening. They knew that there was going to be a pushback from certain people who really wanted that show to happen, and they were prepared to deal with that as well. They adopted a, a true diversity of tactics. They tried to prevent, they raised awareness, they tried to prevent the show from, show from happening in ways that didn't put people at risk of physical violence or physical conflict. And they sort of appealed to people's better nature. They used all of the tactics of liberal anti-fascism, but ultimately it came to using physical opposition as well. It was effective that night. It prevented Graveland from playing. And again, though, like any of these signature incidents, there was a huge fallout afterwards. Part of the fallout was the criticism of Montreal anti-fascists, particularly Montreal militant anti-fascists. There was a criticism that we heard in the UK that they pushed metalheads or people who are into black metal towards the far right, that people's freedom of speech and their own individual freedoms were damaged by the fact that they weren't able to go and watch Graveland play. Um, I think that the people in Montreal had the right to decide that Graveland shouldn't be able to play that festival given the risks that having a band promoting those ideologies causes. Um, and there was, there was a huge, this huge debate about whether it was the right thing to do or not. I think the, the proof that it was the right thing to do hasn't come until a few years down the line. Um, and there's quite a lot of examples of why this was an effective tactic. So each of these actions isn't just, like, like the crass gig, isn't just about this one night. It's about the wider social and cultural impact that it has. I looked through the lineup just to be sure about Mesa de Moore in years since then. As far as I can tell, they've never booked a band since then with such a clear and explicit right-wing ideology. So that festival knows that, that those people are still there and they're not content to allow fascist or neo-Nazi bands to play that festival. The no platform on that night has worked in Montreal. 
but it's also worked way beyond that because it gained so much publicity. There was a tour that was happening in the UK, a band called Marduk and another band called Infernal War. Mm -hmm. um, I won't get into the debate in Marduk, um, but Infernal War are a neo-Nazi band with connections to rock against communism bands and all the worst far-right connections that anybody could have in music. Um, they were due to play in the UK. They actually played one show, they played a show in Cardiff, um, but they had several more shows booked, Manchester being one of them and London being another. And there was some organising by anti-fascists in the UK through a liberal anti-fascist group, like a sort of mainstream, respectable anti-fascist group that doesn't engage in physical opposition, put out a news report about this show that was, uh, these, this band that was playing in the UK and it gained publicity from the BBC, from The Guardian, from mainstream news outlets, raising the profile that this band with hate speech was playing these quite mainstream metal shows. Um, as well as that, other anti-fascist groups, uh, groups that would be willing to use physical opposition as part of their anti-fascist tactics, were also talking about this gig happening and making demands of the venues that these gigs could pulled. And there was organised campaigns through different types of social media to get in touch with the venue and let people know that it wasn't okay for neo-Nazi bands to play mainstream metal shows in the UK. And that became really effective and the momentum built and within a few hours they'd been pulled up every show in the UK. And that, was, that was based, I think, on the weight that the incident in Montreal ha had. People knew that these weren't just empty words. That when people say that we're not happy for neo-Nazi bands to play in our town and we are asking to pull them off the bill or we will physically stop it, these promoters are looking at what happened in Montreal and saying that people are serious about this, people aren't going to tolerate hate speech, hate speech and metal anymore and they're going to shut these shows down. I think that was, that was hugely powerful. The bonus to this incident was that after their UK dates, this tour was then going to the Netherlands and in the Netherlands, people, people picked up there Thank you. Um, yeah, in the Netherlands, people picked up there that that this had happened in the UK, and they got kicked off their shows in the Netherlands as well. This this is this has a huge impact for major like metal tours and more mainstream metal tours. Money comes into it undoubtedly. No matter how cult or underground a band is, if you can't afford to put gas in your vehicle, you can't get to the next show. If you're getting bands kicked off shows and you're having like five or six extra people there who aren't able to play, who aren't able to sell merch, who aren't able to receive their fee for the show, the show becomes financially inviolable very quickly. That's what happened undoubtedly on that tour with Marduk and Infernal War. When you have other bigger black metal bands in particular who may have sympathies or friends with bands who have neo-Nazi ties, they're not going to take that risk of bringing them on tour. They're not going to give them that platform themselves. They start to self-police. Like Mess of the Moor not booking explicitly Nazi bands since that. Bigger metal bands aren't going to take that risk of bringing these neo-Nazi bands on tour. Like, yes, they might get true cult points in their own scene, but ultimately if it causes the tour to fall apart, it won't be worth it for them. So that no platforming in Montreal has this global impact that prevents these bands from playing. Um, it, Reminds us of what happened for anybody who's into punk in particular or oi music. And uh, there was a scene called a very awful music scene called Blood and Honor. And um, Blood and Honor was effectively no platformed. It was based in the UK and was effectively no platformed. Um, and diligently, their shows were placed and shut down through a variety of tactics. Those shows do still happen. I'd be anybody would be forgiven for for thinking that they don't because you never hear about them. They happen in small venues in small towns outside of any major cities. They're not advertised openly. They happen in secret to the point where they may as well not happen. There's no chance of them spreading this ideology further. And that's because of effective no platforming tactics. And if people can do it in pumpkin and oi, they can do it in black metal as well. And I think something similar is starting to happen, which is really positive. Um, this no platforming idea leads into the idea of not conceding cultural ground to the far right. And it gets to one of the most sort of challenging issues that we as Dawn Raid have faced as a band. Um, we were asked to play a show, we were asked to play a festival, a uh, Damnation Festival in Leeds in the UK. A fairly mainstream 
metal festival. Still like underground metal, but definitely the more mainstream end of it. They have some huge bands, bands like Opeth and Alcest, like huge selling metal bands playing at this festival. We were asked to play. We've gone to the Nation Festival. We played their pre-show before. Like it's been part of us being in the metal in the UK for a long time. It's like it's a huge thing to go to every year. You get to see all your friends, you get to see all your favorite bands. And um, some of the best shows we've ever seen have been there. So we were delighted to be asked to play. And um, shortly after that, we were asked to play. We found out that a Polish band called Magua, mm -hmm. spelled M G L A. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not. Um, were also announced for the bill. There's raging debate online about whether Magua are a neo-Nazi band or have fascist ties or sympathies or not. Um, for us, that we didn't really enter into that debate about whether they were a fascist band or not. Um, we accept the research that's been done that they have ties to, to sort of a neo-Nazi music scene. Um, while their music may not sing about it, this is a band that has fascist sympathies. Um, we don't debate that. So we were left in the position of being the band with the smallest font on the poster versus a band with the second biggest font on the poster and the power differential there. We were in no doubt that money plays a huge part in this. That if we were to say we're not playing with that band, the obvious thing is, okay, this band in the smallest font at the bottom of the bill, you're you don't have to play it. Like you're really are you any draw for this festival compared to all these huge headliners that we have. And they probably don't want the hassle for it. However, like, like this decision doesn't just affect us. So we took some time and spoke to lots of different people about it, including Leeds Anti Fascist Network, who got in touch with us about it. And there was different, I know that there was discussions that Leeds Anti Fascist Network had around what way to manage it. Um, and with these discussions, we decided that we were going to play this show. We also discussed it with other bands who were on the bill uh, privately to decide whether we should, as a group, all withdraw and increase our collective power withdrawn as a group or whether as a group we should play and not concede this cultural ground so we did we played damnation festival and um, and we were quite worried about it for for personal safety reasons really as well you're you're entering a space where you very rarely will only enter a space where there's people with these sorts of views and we knew that we were doing that however we also knew that the like 99 percent of the people at this festival that we've been going to for years are good decent people, that there's very few people who have these ideas in metal. It's a, it's a very vocal minority that's given way too much prominence. So we felt that, yes, we're going to be safe going to this festival, we're going to be safe playing there. But also we're not going to tone down or shy away from what Dawn Raid actually is. So we went and we played and Simon, who sings in Dawn Raid, um, spoke about the importance of anti-fascism, spoke about the importance of not fence-sitting, of taking a side, of act of solidarity, as Shama spoke about before we started, of like, being anti-fascist, of helping people who are struggling to cross borders, who need to cross borders for safety, of solidarity with people who fight for trans rights, people who fight for feminism and women's liberation, people who fight for animal liberation, people who fight for the ecology movement. And we spent a long time that day speaking about that. We also wanted to be clear, we wanted to politicise this space we wanted to make it an anti-fascist space and we thought we couldn't leave without brazenly making it that space. So we took an anti-fascist action flag and in the lobby of the Nation Festival where all the merch stalls were, we took our time to pose with a picture of an anti-fascist action flag and were given unwavering support from the vast majority of people there. That was important because while there was fascist fans there, they didn't say anything political, they didn't have any political literature with them. They're, they're cowards, basically, these Nazi bands from our perspective. They hide behind metaphor and pseudonyms because they know that their ideas that aren't agreed with by the vast majority of people. Whereas we were able to brazenly go there and promote the fact that we were an anarchist and anti-fascist band, along with friends of ours who are also anti-fascist and anarchist bands. And all of a sudden we were able to change the balance of that festival, from a mainstream metal festival that sort of tolerated these right-wing ideas to a mainstream, mainstream metal festival that had promoted outspoken and brazen anarchist and anti-fascist bands. And we were able to provide that hope for that, along with friends of ours who were also playing. Um, tactically, I'm still not sure if that's the right thing to do or not. It was a decision that we came to, and we decided to start taking up that cultural ground 
Um, and I know that there are a lot of people out there who thought that yes, we should do it, but also there's people out there who thought no, like that you shouldn't do that. We shouldn't be willing to share that platform. Um, honestly, we trying to we're trying to make the decisions that are going to be best for us, but also thinking about the wider consequences. We felt if we didn't play, that politics just wouldn't would be. If us and the other anti-fascist bands pulled off the ball, the politics would be less present at that festival. So tactically, we thought this was the right thing to do. Um, I hope it was the right decision. And again, it takes a bit of time to tell whether it was or not. Um, but we're content with the decision that we made. Um, it is the sort of the anarchist and anti-fascist principle of no quarter or conceding no cultural ground. Um, and that was something that we wanted to do. Um, I'm always interested to hear of any different opinions on that as well, because these things are conversations. And any of the decisions that we make that are moral or ethically difficult, we want to hear what people think about them as well, because that's how we sort of develop our understanding. Um, because as we say, we're only talking about from our experience of living in the UK, and we know that as white people living in the UK, so we know that lots of other people have different experiences as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a group from the UK, a neo-Nazi group that formed, who had an interest in black metal. Um, they were called National Action. Um, interestingly, a lot of them were based in Merseyside or Liverpool in the northwest of England where we are based. Um, and it helps illustrate some of the points that we've been talking about. They were really, they were really young. They were really culturally switched on, and they formed out of the image board culture. Um, so they're really computer literate and digitally literate. They were using 4chan and 8chan, but they were also using a lot of black metal imagery and music to recruit. Um, their aesthetics, the, the music they put to their videos, the way they conducted themselves. These were people who were really into black metal and using black metal and its culture as a recruiting ground for some of the most horrendous fascist ideologies that exist in our era. Um, they took up a, a part of the cultural territory that had been left by traditional left-wing groups. There was no left-wing groups occupying these image boards and, and sort of talking about these ideas about sort of the earth and, and health and strength the way that these fascist groups were. And it, for whatever reason, a lot of people were drawn into it. This group were, they're the only far right group in the UK to ever be prohibited by the government. That's how violent they were. It's hard to imagine a more militant group. They inspired Adam Often Division in North America. Adam Often Division drew a lot of their inspiration from National Action. National Action, though, have gone. Um, they were banned by the state, but they were banned by the state after they were already on a downturn. There is a podcast, 12 Rules for What, um, that deals with the rise and fall of National Action in detail. And a lot of these, a lot of this is pulled from their really effective research. But I think there's several things that defeated national action. They had a national demonstration in Liverpool. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, Liverpool is a traditionally left-wing working class city. It's known for having extended white cat strikes over several generations, both in the early 1900s, and then they also had extensive miners or dock, docker strikes during the Thatcher era. So it's always been seen as a left-wing city. National Action wanted to have their demonstration there because it was territory that other right-wing groups had failed in. And because they set themselves up as this, the most militant and this new generation of young, switched-on neo-Nazis, they thought that they could go to Liverpool. Um, it went really badly for them. Um, if anybody's not seen, it's worth having a Google for the image of them. They got actually locked in the left luggage area of the train station. Um, the level of opposition from the local community was so huge that they'd arranged to meet in the train station and there were thousands of just ordinary people. There was obviously people who were organised anti-fascists there, but just thousands of normal people came down and they weren't able to get out of the train station. They had to be escorted out under a heavy police guard for their own safety. All of a sudden that group's less powerful and less attractive. You have these young, like, young disillusioned people looking for something strong to attach themselves to and a group who've been locked in a left luggage area of a train station probably doesn't fulfil that role for them anymore. Um, they tried to then, <coughs> they really went underground after that. They had one more outing in Dover, on the UK coast, um, along where they allied with lots of other neo-Nazi groups who were less like them. They weren't, they weren't these groups who were into black metal. They were more of the traditional boneheads in the UK. So they'd already had to then align themselves with something that they weren't initially part of. And again, they were roundly beaten by a huge anti-fascist response. 
Um, that was a much closer call, the numbers weren't the same as in Liverpool. Yeah, there was a lot of different types of nationalists and patriots and far right who were in Dover that day. And maybe not as many anti-fascists because it wasn't in such a, a, a city with such a strong trade union and left-wing history. But the two times they came out into the streets, really, they were beaten. So they no longer have that strength and power that they, that they sort of promoted themselves with. They, it's, they then were, ended up being banned by the state and designated as a terror group. And that sort of marked the end of them. But they were already, as I said, they were already on the downturn by that stage and have been beaten. I think what's, what's important here is that what beat them was a combination of numbers and ordinary people standing up and saying this isn't acceptable. Really good research by dedicated anti-fascists to know that they were going to be in the train station that day, to know their movements, and militant anti-fascists who were willing to engage in physical opposition and take that step forward first. The one problem with national action is that the circumstances that led to them forming haven't really changed. The void that they filled is still there. The left hasn't found a way to really start taking up that cultural ground effectively. And has, is only starting to really understand why so many people were drawn into it. Um, I, I believe as an anarchist that people are inherently good. I don't believe that these people were inherently evil and were always destined to go down that road. I might be wrong, but I really don't think at least not all of them were inherently evil. Something happened that led these people down this road. And these, there are people, undoubtedly, in that group who are disillusioned by capitalism and the crisis in capitalism, who maybe are concerned about things like the environment. And where the left should be moving in and giving them a, a better alternative, they just weren't there. Um, I think the left is very good, and the anarchist left is very good at occupying certain subcultural spaces and academic spaces, but there's huge swathes of working class space that are missed out on. Um, Groups like National Action used extreme music and extreme imagery and used tremble picking guitars and blast beats and this false history of neo-Nazism and black metal to recruit. If there isn't an alternative, they're going to be able to use that tactic time and time again. That's why it comes back to what Crass, what Martin Lux and the anti-fascism in London done with Crass and what the people in Montreal done with Graveland. We need to be shutting them down, we need to be removing the power that they have, we need to be removing their platform, but we also have to be providing an alternative. With Dawn Raid, we don't shy away from using black metal imagery, we don't shy away from playing black metal, that's the music that we want to play, that's the imagery that we like to use. We see nothing wrong with that imagery, like that imagery isn't either extreme right or extreme left, um, but we want to play this music, we want to offer anti-fascist black metal. I think in an interview, and this got used as a pull-out quote and caused some drama on the internet. But we said that the only true black metal is anarchist black metal. And stand by that today. Um, if black metal is supposed to be revolutionary, it's supposed to be radical. It has to be anarchist, it has to be against authority, it has to be against fascism. It has to be revolutionary and inspiring. While it, while it can be nihilistic, that nihilism should never be, should never be punching down. Um, there's no room for NSBM anymore. And we just need to keep taking up that cultural ground. So we need to be confronting, I think we need to be confronting neo-Nazi bands when they, when they arise, not giving them a platform, not considering, conceding any cultural ground to them. And then the final step of that, I think, is that we should be starting to move into these spaces and taking up the territory that they've traditionally held. Um, that's kind of part of the purpose of Dawn Raid. Dawn Raid primarily is to write black metal songs that are important to us but also it exists in a wider political context that we're aware of. And that was kind of everything that I wanted to say. Thank you, that was great. Uh, we've got a little bit over 10 minutes for a Q&A. Anybody have? I'll, I have one to start off with that sort of ties to your final comments a little bit. One of the things I, I see a lot on kind of social media when it comes to sort of anti-fascist black metal, and, I, and I'm saying this not just to be polite, but People always kind of set Don Raid aside and say, aside from Don Raid, a lot of anti-fascist black metal isn't good music. And I just want to hear your thoughts about kind of this either excuse of saying, oh, it's not good music, or where, where is the kind of, because part of what you're describing is a role that, bla that black metal should play, 
and people criticizing the quality of the music that kind of... I think I've heard a lot of bad black metal, whether it's anti-fascist or apolitical or any other political ideology, um, but I've also heard a lot of good black metal from um, that is anti-fascist as well. I think at the end of the day, this is music. It has to, if it's going to be culturally relevant, it has to be culturally good. Um, so I think primarily, if you just choose to start a band purely for the politics, that's cool and like full support for that. But if if it's not good musically, I wouldn't expect people to like it because it has to. Like, at the end of the day, it is about writing songs. There's lots of other ways to be an effective anarchist or an effective anti-fascist that isn't starting a black metal band, <laughs> but um, probably way more effective ways. But if you are going to start a black metal band and you are anti-fascist, definitely say it out loud. Um, I think that's the important thing, and that's the way that we can remove that grey zone and start to take up more and more space. There is like the red anarchist black metal movement that's been around for a while, and there's like, there's some amazing bands that have come through that. I think there's a lot of very prominent bands, particularly on Twitter, um, and maybe a lot of bands set up with good intentions of taking up that space. But definitely, I, I wouldn't say that the most effective form of anti-fascism is to start a black metal band. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you are in a black metal band, awesome. Um, the last comments that you just made about uh, black metal being anti-authoritarian and all, you know, how it started and all, it's very interesting because all those elements that you just countered, I I encountered in the NSBM, you know, scene, not only the musicians, but also fans or supporters. Um, they also think that they are um, anti-authoritarian, anti-regimes, they go against society, so like following kind of the black metal uh, aspects, but also in, in today's society, they're against uh, uh, liberalism. So like it's, it's it's really, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm not talking as a scholar who's trying to understand why these people, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but being those teenagers or young adults who are, as you said, not very well oriented in other stuff, like, um, the similarities or the purposes are, are too disturbing, and then you have to get into deep politics in order to, you know, understand that the UK uh, um, um, example is far different from that of Ukraine yeah. and Eastern Europe, generally yeah. speaking, and that's why they're thriving there so much, mm -hmm. and frankly speaking, they don't, they don't care of being mainstream, they kind of like being underground. Yeah. And they are, yeah. in, in, you know, like especially today with the online technology, yeah. they don't even need, they, they have all, you know, the tools and they have their own, like the three bands that you mentioned before, even mm -hmm. Graveland and Infernal War, they are being produced from Darker Than Black, who yeah. is owned by Henrik Mobus of Absurd. Yeah. They are NSBM bands, you know. Yeah. So this, this clash between the two, it's, um, it's, it's, interesting and also how do you explain that to people that yeah i think like i i really like taking music as an example not the political yeah i really don't know entirely and um, i think you're right that, that there is a an nsbm scene that is unfortunately thriving uh, particularly in the countries you mentioned um, and particularly with that record label um, there's a myriad of reasons as to why that's the case. Yeah. I think the, I think that for me the obvious answer is that fascism will never be anti-authoritarian, mm -hmm. but by its very nature, it's an authoritarian ideology, and like there, I think I read an account of somebody who left the fascist group and became an anti-fascist, and he talked about how he was he wasn't taught how to think, mm -hmm. and he was part of a group in the UK. Um, the article was posted on Owen Six Months Festival's website. It's very definitely worth reading. Um, he talked about how he got involved in strength and culture and all of these ideas that seemed really positive to him. And he was training and out in nature and doing these things that seemed important. And he was also interested in black metal. But he, he was also seeing himself as an anti authoritarian. And he realized that he was just following the doctrine that was set for him. He wasn't taught how to think, he was taught what to think. Um, I think a lot of like Henry Bobus and his bands, they pretend to be anti-authoritarian. And they pretend that they're revolutionary when actually they're extremely conservative 
I'm backwards thinking uh, from my perspective as an mm -hmm. anarchist. Um, how we get that message across, I really don't know, but I think that as far as possible we should be, you're right that they have a platform, but we should be working to reduce their platform. Um, they do, people do like the fact that it's underground, yeah. but the more underground we can push it, for me the better. Um, and the space that we give those bands to breathe and to grow, we can reduce that. And while Infernal War can go and play these very modern shows, they're not able to play more mainstream metal shows and they're not able to get those ideas out to a broader audience because of effective no platforming. So if, while we are reducing the space, that's a positive. It's a negative that we still have this space to operate. But I think that we should be working harder to continue to reduce that space. And if there are people who really like the sound of harsh tremolo guitars and blast beats and are really feeling like an anti-authoritarian sentiment and who are disillusioned with capitalism and who are concerned about the climate catastrophe that's on the horizon, we should be providing an alternative from them. We shouldn't be the only option they have shouldn't be to go to Asgard's right and the yeah. extreme right. At least we should be offering them something more positive to turn to. and like some like pretty crazy shit can happen so like you want to be careful but then just also be aware that like you know how powerful like words can be too it's like you know sometimes a lot can be done by like approaching someone like that and like just like being cool to them and like talking about it and just be like you know you can just be like open face it's like the politics are kind of fucked up but like uh you know and like here's why you know like sit down like yeah. Like, obviously, it's like, you know, that's only certain situations where you do that. There's going to be situations where you can't, and like, you got to do what you got to do, but like, you know, make sure you're safe and everything. But yeah. that's exactly the kind of the point, though. Every time doing that, it's like, that might prevent like crazy situations from happening later on. And also, you know, you might save yourself or that person. So, yeah. and it also has a much deeper impact if you're, you're like, reaching out to someone like, you know, to come at them from like a place of like love and some pay essentially like it's like that can be fucking huge for someone. So. Yeah, I, th I don't know. It's just like interesting that point of like you know like kind of like welcoming to bring that it's like that's like such a devastating weapon against fascism that's like that should be utilized yeah. a lot more than it is. Like. Yeah, I think that's. I agree with all of that. I think people are inherently good um, in circumstances and disillusionment leads people to feel <laughs> detached from the people around them and go for these ideas. But if they find an alternative welcoming space, then I think yeah. the vast majority of them are going to take that on because it's a much, a much more pleasant way to live and a much more meaningful way to live than going for these. Yeah, and having those conversations too is like, that's cool because it challenges like your own ideas of that as well. It's like, for so many years I was like, always around like-minded people and like, you know, the scene, like, so it's like, you know, having these sort of dialogues and stuff, like, you quick and sort of skip on and just like, is this a dialogue, you know? So it's like, it's cool because it like, you know, like I still, like, still have those like same politics and same beliefs and stuff, but like by having like, like you know, hard conversations with like, people like that, it's like, of course you like, you know, refine it and then to like actually understand it. Like, one thing I've noticed is like, a lot of people I've met who like, like anarchist community and like, my community and stuff, there's like, Still, a lot of people that like, or like, you know, it's like a choking few course of anarchism, where it's like and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. like libertarian politics in general, or like it's like, you know, you can 
recruited, but it's like, you know, it's like, do you really understand it? It's like, because I feel like it, the nature of America is like, yeah, I, I want to give some time to some more people skills. if there's any. Sorry. Any other? Um, I want to kind of dovetail on some of these questions and, and ask, um, do you find that people are responding, that are, people are coming to Don Raid from the, from the side of like, we're interested in, in black metal and we're discovering through, through listening to Don Raid's albums and lyrics, kind of um, anarchist politics? And, I really hope so. I think most people who come to see Don Raid are there because they like black metal. They heard the records and they think they sound cool and they want to come and see it live the same way right, why most people go to gigs. Um, I think that there are, or I hope that there are, there are people who come um, who maybe are apolitical or who have different beliefs who are given a sincere explanation as to why Don Raid is an anti-fascist and an anarchist band. Um, we provide a platform for anarchist and anti-fascist ideas um, at all of our shows. We, we distribute um, flyers explaining mm -hmm. what anarchism means to us as a band. Um, we're more than welcome to have local groups, particularly people who want to promote, promote local anti-oppressive groups and um, those ideas. We like them to come to our shows as well if they're able to. And use any platform that we have to promote positive alternatives. Like what you were saying, like people, like people need to understand that there is an alternative there so we try to try to make sure that that option's there and um, there are people who have told us like and it was amazing that through talking about anarchism or listening to Don Raid that they've started to look at those ideas further and um, there was an example at one of our shows on this tour somebody wearing a t-shirt of a huge metal band that is a right wing band and um, the person came over to talk at our merch they took some of the literature that was there they spoke positively about being at the show. It was their first ever time at a black metal show. Um, and they were met with ideas of inclusivity and anti-oppressive politics. And um, I'm glad that, that person came to our show and was welcomed at the show, was treated with compassion. I hope they got to see a really good like, metal show at the end of the day, because that's a huge part of it. But they also left with literature that they were really interested in that was positive and anti-oppressive. Thanks. Um, Unless there's any more... I have just one. Uh, is there any collaboration between anarcho-punk bands and, and black metal anarcho -punk? Yeah, massively. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think especially in the UK for us. Mm -hmm. um, like our, like one of my favourite bands, Deviated Instinct. We played with them. We played with Conflict um, in Liverpool. Like an old anarcho-punk band. Um, yeah, there's like a lot of crossover there. That's not just political. That's because... like. I don't know anyone who sincerely just listens to black metal. Like, mm -hmm. like Crust is amazing. Like um, loads of types of punk is amazing. Loads of electronic music and hip hop and rap. Like I would be boring if it was just black metal. So, yeah. <laughs> I know in one of your band photos, one of you is wearing an East an Iskra. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> you know they're from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Iskra is amazing band. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And. Um, I assume you all know, but in case you don't, right, we're going to get to see Don Ray perform, and Don Ray and Ragnar perform uh, really soon in Cavity, so I hope you're all planning to head over there. <laughs>